Hello and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. Today we're going to have the second part of my talk with Jake from thevoluntarylife.com. Jake runs a podcast called The Voluntary Life where he talks about different ways that you can find freedom in an unfree world. If you missed the first part of the chat, you can pop back and find it earlier on the feed. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. I just wanted to come back to the voluntary life. We sort of went off on a little bit of a, uh, a diversion there, which mm. was great. But um, one, one thing I wanted to ask you about the voluntary life is what were the biggest challenges that you faced in setting up this project? Um, because I'm, I know that you've, you were in entrepreneurship for about 10 years, so you have a lot of experience in sort of striking out and doing something yourself and being in, you know, sort of project managing it and getting going. And um, I think, I mean, one of the things that I've really struggled with is the idea of kind of putting myself out there and being visible. And obviously you had a lot of experience with that Mm. before starting this, but, you know, did you, were there any challenges in particular, maybe some that were, that you weren't expecting to have that you had? In terms of setting up the podcast? Yeah. I think the thing about the podcast is because I, it's something that has evolved just as a labor of love. You know, I just really enjoy doing it. Mm. So I think it's, you know, for me, it's been it's been really good fun doing it. And I suppose it, it's not a, um, because it's not really a business at the moment. And I'm not sure what I want to do with it. It's mm. I am taking donations and it is starting uh, to be that. But um, I don't feel like that pressure that I did for example when I started my business you know when I really that that was um uh, I think a lot more difficult um because there was a lot more riding on it you know that was basically how I was going to support myself and so that I think is it's in starting a business where I probably can say more useful things about about that what I really like about what you said though is that you know if there are people who are listening who they've got their own ideas they've got their own projects that they want to start what I'm hearing from what you're saying is that when you're trying to make it a business, there's that real pressure there, um, which is what you felt before. But if it's more just like a side project, a hobby and something that you're really passionate about, and, you know, like you said, you accept donations, so maybe there's the potential to turn it into a business in the future. Mm. But right now, it's just something that you are purely doing out of passion for the topics, passion for sharing the ideas and so on, and kind of making connections with other people who have those passions as well that actually that's a lot less pressure and a lot less challenging and stressful than perhaps jumping straight in and trying to do something yourself yeah i think it depends on what you want from the project Mm. i will say though in terms of what you said about you know the sort of um, fears of putting yourself out there i have certainly experienced that with the voluntary life too because when you're talking about sort of some unconventional choices about freedom these are subjects that I know, you know, are going to be quite sound kind of wacky to a lot of people and are going to sound yeah. really, you know, very, um, well, unconventional and t- totally out there. And so there's definitely a part of me that, that um, experiences that fear of what level of acceptance am I going to have for putting these ideas out there, how much... Uh, negative feedback am I going to get for talking about things which are not mainstream and not sort of um, bland, you know? Mm. And so I I definitely experienced that. Um, and that's something that, you know, I don't think it's possible to completely detach yourself from. If you, if yeah. you, we're, we're so social that, you know, we're all, everyone's always going to be a bit, um, have a certain um, sensitivity and fear about, whether they themselves are going to be accepted among in you know in the in the country they live in the place where they live and stuff for for the things that they do, yeah. um, so you know I think that's a that, that's a genuine thing that that we have to um, experience. Yeah, and I, I think again it's a really valid fear as well because ultimately if you are doing something creative, which you know your podcast is, um, and you're really kind of putting your opinions and your values out there people are going to criticize you because, mm. you know, hate is going to hate, basically. You're never going to be able to please everyone. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, so it's really, I guess what I get from what you're saying is that it's more about, it's less about kind of um, avoiding, trying to avoid criticism and sort of watering down what you have to say 
to do that. And it's more about just feeling confident enough in your values and feeling secure enough in what you believe in and passionate enough about it to be able to weather whatever comes yeah, your Yeah, definitely. Way. Because, I mean, you know, everything that I'm doing, uh, I really believe in uh, all of the ideas that I'm talking about and where there's sort of ideas that I don't actually agree with, I'm still happy to put them out there in terms of saying, you know, this is a different perspective or whatever. Yeah. But the thing is that, um, yeah, I because I feel... Uh, I feel happy and confident um, about sort of why I think these are valuable things for other people to consider. And the thing is that also other people are going to have to decide for themselves what they make of these things. Absolutely. You know, I'm not actually that invested in whether or not people choose to use these ideas in their own lives. That's up to them. Yeah. I'm interested because it's for me that the journey is also about finding out more about freedom for myself. And I'm interested in terms of other people's ideas and everything, but it's up to it's up to everyone themselves to decide how free they want to try and you know make their lives. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And I also wanted to say that I think, I mean, it, it is a risk because we are social beings. We do, you know, we really need acceptance from the community around us, and that's on a level, on an evolutionary level, it's really necessary to our survival as well. Just a really basic instincts like that um i think it's a really it is a risk putting your ideas out there especially if they kind of go against the grain a little bit and i think it's a really brave thing to do oh thank you i really appreciate that i i I do feel that i am by no means a like great example of just always putting yourself totally out there because i know that for example when i started my business i was very sort of very conscious about um, trying to be as professional as possible and present a very professional image mm. and to, to be as convincing because I was selling consultancy and quite high level sort of um, uh, uh, analytical consultancy. And so, you know, I got quite invested in the, in the image of the company and the image of the work that we do. And I think there's a positive side to that, which is to do with integrity of the work and showing that you're yeah. r- reliable and trustworthy. But there's also... Another side, which is I felt like I had to be quite careful about talking in more broader terms about my interests. Being yourself. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a cost to your authenticity in that as well. Definitely. And for now, like, I think one of the things about the voluntary life is that, yeah, I'm just talking about all the things that really interest me, which is great. Yeah, (laughs) I think that's one of the really great things about doing your own thing as well, because obviously entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Some people feel a lot more comfortable working um, for a small, medium, large size company, or um, working with other people, you know, having a boss or a manager who will kind of structure their day for them, etc. And lo- you know, I, I, for understandable reasons, like it's really hard sometimes not having that. Mm. But um, I guess that's one of the things is that, in my experience, certainly when I have been in uh, that kind of environment, I have definitely had to present a certain. A facade or watered down portion of myself and ultimately it's inevitably become very frustrating I felt very dissatisfied um, because you know with the sort of fear of visibility that I talked about earlier there is also a real desire to be visible and to be yourself yeah. and to be able to kind of share your ideas with people and sometimes you you know you have to work out what the best approach is to to making sure that you do feel visible and you are able to be authentic because sometimes it's just the fact of life that you have to have a sort of one part of your life where you know you're you're only going to be talking about work related specific things Mm -hmm. and another part of your life where you get you know you have your friendships and everything where you can be truly authentic but that distinction has always got i think some risks involved in it you've got to be careful about how um how, in t- how you get to stay in touch with your, your authenticity. I know that for me, you know, there came a time when I really felt like, okay, I've, I've had enough. Once I'd sold my business, I was working for a really big corporation and I was sort of fitting into to a, somebody else's uh, uh, structure in business. And I really didn't feel like I could be authentic in my own 
professional way in that business either. So it was kind of the worst of both worlds. Like I, I didn't, yeah. I wasn't, I kept my personal and my private life, my private interests out of work, which I considered to be part of the, just the aspect of professionalism. But even in work, I didn't feel able to have to do the kind of work that I wanted to do mm. and to work in the way that I wanted to work. And that's the kind of authenticity too, is yeah, your professional absolutely. authenticity to yeah. be, you know, to be, to be able to work in the way that you feel is what, what your clients or your customers need and what you feel is the good work that you want to do and so forth. Absolutely. And to be able to um, work in an environment and be in an environment that is conducive to you doing your best work as yeah. well. And because, you know, just going back to the whole issue of creativity, um, it's incredibly meaningful and fulfilling and satisfying to know that you are producing sort of the best creative work that you can do. And it's incredibly um, frustrating and dissatisfying and unfulfilling when that's being stifled for whatever reason, whether it's the corporate environment or the culture of the company you work for or just the kind of work that you're doing isn't sort of, you know, um, floating your boat. It's, mm. it's really, it is really, really tough when that's the case. Yeah, definitely. So what does the future hold for the voluntary life? Do you know? <laughs> That's a very good question. I mean, it's an interesting time at the moment because I'm not sure um, mm. what I'm going to do with the voluntary life. I really, you know, I'm really enjoying the feedback. Um, I'm really enjoying hearing uh, people tell me about how they've experienced the podcast and the ideas. And it's really rewarding to hear about people, you know, actually finding value in the podcast and doing things with these ideas themselves. Mm. I, mm. I, I, I'm, I find that um, really rewarding. So um, I'm not sure um, quite where I'm going to take it next. And that's an interesting place to be in because I suppose I, you know, I spent a long time really trying to build and, and plan and develop an enterprise and a business and go forward and look, look very as long term as possible. But I also kind of realized that there are some aspects of any project where it does kind of have a life of its own and it does yeah, sort of evolve. Absolutely. I think you can be very conscious about that and it's good, especially in a business context. You need to be really measuring everything and conscious of you know exactly what's going on. But there's also a certain extent to which it it sort of has it takes on its own uh, its own dynamic, its own life. And so I have ideas for books that can come out of what mm -hmm. I'm doing and I'm thinking about those. I also have ideas for um, more podcasts and more content that I want to talk about. Um, so, you know, it's a, a time of transition. We'll, we'll have to see. That's great. And I, <laughs> what I really like about what you're saying is that quite often if people are thinking of starting their own projects or let's, you know, just to take the entrepreneurship angle, for example, um, there's a lot of conflicting advice about how you should start your business that goes around now but a lot of people are in the camp of you should know where you're going and you should have your you know 10 page business plan and you should have all these trajectories and um projections for the future and everything and i really like what you said about the fact that if you start a project like this especially a creative project you don't know where it's going because it always has a life of its own mm. and um that's again that's quite scary for people but I what I really like about what you're saying is the fact that it's okay not to have a plan you don't have to have this sort of uh yeah five year ten year projection of what's going to happen in the future and where your project is going to go and know what exactly you want to do with it whether it's a hobby a business whatever if there's something that you're passionate about and you love it's okay not to know what you're going to do with it in the future because right now you're loving it mm. and that's the most important thing is if it feels meaningful and fulfilling to you right now absolutely i, I think the one thing that i would say is it, it's more important to be conscious about what is going on now in your project what you're doing now and to actually be very aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it than it is to, to have grand plans about what's going to happen in five years' time. Yeah. And so, you know, I talked about this in one of the podcasts, but just very briefly, for example, business plans, you can often write these business plans where we're going to do X, we're going to do Y, and then, you know, year three, this is going to happen, and year five, this is going to happen. And these are big sort of dreams about the future, mm. which have very limited contact with reality. <coughs> 
in comparison to mm. the reality of what is happening now. The thing that I think really helped me in my business was measuring everything about what was going on in the business itself. How profitable were each of the different activities we're involved in? What, how, how much time was everything taking? How was the cash flow working? When were bills going to get paid? These were all being really conscious of the, of the now. And I yeah. think that's true, not just in a business, but in a hobby or anything. It's more important to be aware of why are you doing what it is yeah. you're doing now? What are you getting out of it? And you know, what's actually going on? Because in a sense, that gives you the information about where to go next. Yeah. If so in, a, in a business, if you know, like if you're measuring everything and you know this project is really profitable and this project is totally unprofitable, that is important information that you can use to actually, you know, change direction of the business and go in the direction of where you think you're going to have more opportunity. And that kind of information is about leading a conscious life. It's actually yeah. about being aware. It's like... The, the, the Socrates thing about the unexamined life is, is not worth living. You know, yeah. I, I think that's, that's where you can get real value is in being conscious of what you're doing now. It's great to dream. It's great to have plans. And I've got nothing against sort of having long-term dreams and visions and plans and goals. That's all great. But the, the value of, of really being conscious about what's going on now, and that means measuring it, is, is, is huge. Yeah. So the, I guess there's two things I'm thinking about hearing you talk like that. And, um, the first thing is that, you know, there's the, as you were saying, there's the measuring on a kind of analytical level. So, for example, if you have a business or a money-making project, um, which is a bit redundant because that is a business, <laughs> um, there's measuring the cash flow, measuring, you know, how many customers you've got, etc. Um, if you have a website, measuring visitors, bounce rate, you know, and all that, all that jazz. But then there's the emotional analytics as well. So if you have a project that you're you're starting, whatever kind of a project it is, whether it's for profit or not for profit, whether it's you know educational, fun, etc., the doing the emotional measurement is really really important. So how do I feel about this? Mm. Why am I doing it? What is my motivation? Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's that is what it is to live a conscious life and to do these things consciously. Mm. And in connection with that, um, another thing that you were saying took me back to something that I said earlier about, you know, life is a process and we are constantly changing and shifting. And, I, and I've experienced this. I think the real danger with having a big plan is that you, you, it's like you set out this groove. You have your big plan way over there and you kind of set out a groove in the earth going to your big plan and then you just stay in that groove no matter what else changes and really because we are constantly changing and our, our desires and our preferences and our ambitions and who we are is always shifting you know that plan might not be right for us at some point but the danger is if you get stuck in that groove you're just going to be so focused on getting to the plan that actually you're going to you're going to stop enjoying it. You're going to really stop. It's not going to be authentic work anymore because the focus has become on the plan rather than, okay, how am I doing today? What do I feel today? What is my motivation today? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. And I have, it's a funny relationship with plans and goals and dreams because I think there's a, a bit of a dance, a bit of a balance to be had between how you, how you treat those dreams. Yeah. I know that, for example... I can directly look back at a number of things. Um, well, actually, let me say this first of all. I think the, the wonderful thing about us is that we do dream and that we do have ideas to change the world. And there's a, a, a great quote in that book, The Philosophical Baby, where I think uh, Alison Gopnik talks about, you know, if you look at the world around you, the building that you're in at the moment... That was somebody's dream once. Mm. That was somebody's vision that only existed in someone's mind yeah. and we built it, you know. Yeah. And our whole world is an imagined world that has come because we have had goals and plans and dreams and we have actually l looked at the world now and saw something that could be different and gone and changed it. And that's a wonderful thing, you know, it's a, a really amazing thing about being human is to be able to dream and have goals. And I love that. At the same yeah. time, it is true that I can look back on my life and I know there have been times 
when I've been so bloody minded about a specific goal mm. that I've completely missed out the reality of the situation. And for example, you know, a negotiation went really badly because I just did not see that the, the situation was different to to how I envisaged. This is how it should work in the yeah. end, right? Yeah. And in other circumstances, you know, you can get very focused on doing one thing, and you can, um, you know, you can lose track of of the reality that you're in. So I think there's that balance of being able to dream and have goals, but also to keep changing your goals or, or refining your goals when reality shows you different, you know? Yeah, I think that's so true. And I, I, I just want to clarify from my perspective, I think having goals and having dreams and ambitions is so important mm. because otherwise it's really easy to just sort of drift mm. and not really do anything. And then you get to, you know, a year later and you're thinking, wow, that was what was I doing for the last year? Why Why did I make all these choices? Because you don't have that um, that conscious awareness of what it is you really want. Yeah. Um, and I'm a huge fan of things like visualization, so visualizing mm. the future. And um, David Allen in his book, Getting Things Done, talks about having the 50,000, 100,000 foot view yes yeah. and also doing sort of five ten year plans etc and where do you want to be who do you want to be with yeah. what do you want to be doing in five or ten years time and i think those things are really really useful but i think it's so crucial to remember as well that if you do that and if you make your five or ten year plan if you do a visualization and you see your future that is not set in stone yeah. that's just where you are right now and you can go back in you know, tomorrow or in two weeks, and it might be completely different. Yeah. But it's just staying conscious of where you are right now and what do you want in the future right now, and that it's okay if that changes. Yeah, I think it's being open to negotiating with yourself. Yeah. You know, it's so yeah. that you, I think that there, we can have a fear that if I really put this goal out there and commit it to paper, I'm going to become a slave driver of myself. Yeah. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work myself to death trying to get to this goal when it might not actually work out or something. I think we, it works best when we have the courage to commit that goal to paper, to be aware of what that goal is, but also that we're able to negotiate with ourselves when the goal changes. Yeah, we have, so we have the courage to commit and the courage to change as well. Yeah, yeah. And then, so for the example I gave before it was a, a negotiation that really didn't work out well because I just... I committed to this goal and then I just thought, right, I'm just going to plow on mm. and try and get, and, and that I lost track of that. Once an example I can think of where it worked better is that when I actually started my business, I was convinced it was going to be a web-based um, application service provision, um, which would be that people would log on and we would charge them a fee to use our software online. And that was how it was going to work. Right. Mm. And after a year and a half of developing where we'd done some consultancy work to pay the bills of the software development, you know, I actually, a friend of mine helped me, um, sort of advised me about how the business was going and said, that's where you're making money and it, there's so much development to be made in consultancy and there's so much development to be done to turn it into this web-based thing. Yeah. Why do you want to do that? And I felt great about actually being able to change the goal because, yeah. you know, it was reality had shown that actually it's just not going to work like that. Yeah, and I think you know deep down, don't you, when you're in situations like that, that it's just not working. There's almost this kind of rising sense of anxiety that comes up. And it's quite relief, quite a relief when someone says, you know, you don't have to do this. Yeah. You've got this other option as well. And you're like, phew, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sometimes we need that outside perspective. I certainly found that helpful, you know, to, to, to get um, a friend and yeah. a, a sort of a mentor to help me think through those ideas because the, the this balance between having the courage to dream but also the courage to negotiate with yourself it's very hard to do alone as well i think it's good Definitely. good to talk to, that's one of these and this sort of brings it back to what we were talking about in terms of needing support you know and he it being yeah. really important he surround yourself right with. you need yeah. people in your life who you can actually talk about your dreams with and you can talk about it in a way that they're not going to just stamp all over them, but they're also going to help you when it comes to thinking like, yeah, this dream is coming into contact with reality and sort of sparks are flying. And why is that, you know, why isn't that working better, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that came up for me when you were saying that is I was just thinking, you know, um, that they'll know, they'll be able to support you and they'll know what kind of motivation you need as well. Like, they'll know you well enough to know 
what kind of support to offer. So I, I was just thinking of an example, and um, this is on a completely different level to what you were talking about with your business, but um, we've had conversations about when I go running, mm. and I always set myself a target. So I have a certain place along the coastline that I aim to get to. Mm. And I, I was actually thinking this a few days ago because I went out and I got a really bad stitch halfway through. Like I was in, I've never had a stitch quite like that before. I don't usually get stitches. So it was, it took, really took me by surprise. And I was only halfway to my target point and I was literally like <laughs> limping along, <laughs> trying to force myself yeah. to get to this. And, and I, because I have a very strong, um, I have that internal slave driver mm. big time. So if I set myself a goal, it's really hard for me to change it. Mm. Um, and especially with measurable things like how far you can run. So mm. like measurable things I find really hard to change. And I was actually thinking of a conversation that we'd had a few days before that when you pointed that out to me and you said, you know, you don't always have to go that far. Like you don't have to turn it into a torture exercise because <laughs> you know it's it's exercise it's good for you as long as you do some it's yeah. fine basically you don't always have to push yourself so hard and that was really helpful that's that was the kind of support that I needed at that point um and so it was really helpful for me going out running a few days ago getting this excruciating stitch and thinking like it's okay for me to walk for a bit <laughs> you know <laughs> I don't have to sort of power through because I know that there'll be other people who would say oh well, you know no pain no gain you've got to power through it and keep going but that's for me that is not the kind of support that I need because I already have that voice telling me you should be powering through it mm -hmm. so what's helpful for me is having the different perspective of like it's okay not to do that it's okay to walk for a bit it's okay to take it easy on yourself and not not for that slave driver to kind of not be punishing you and not be making you do things that are physically painful or uncomfortable. I'm so glad. I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, I, I treasure about our relationship is that it, I think we are able to give each other support in that way. Mm. And that's, you know, that's something that is, is very important to, to have that in your life. Yeah. And, uh, I think I, having I, the right kind of support. Absolutely. Really and I, I receive the same kind of support from you all the time as well. So, you know, that's, that's really important. And I think that's why, that's why we're talking about this because we, you know, I think it's, this is something that I hope other people can experience in, in their relationships too. And, mm. uh, both in their romantic relationships and their friendships and so forth that you can get people in your life and people around you who you able, you feel able to be authentic with and to get support from at the same time. Mm, absolutely. And I think you, just on that note, I think you need to be authentic with people in order to get the right kind of support. So as I was just saying, you know, if someone had said to me, well, no pain, no gain, that wouldn't have been particularly helpful for me because I already have that, yeah. that drive. But because you know me so well and because I'm able to be authentic with you, you know that the kind of support I need is slightly gentler approach but right. you can tell me you know it's okay to take a break yeah absolutely so i think that's really important too so just as a, a last question we've been talking for quite a while now um if if people are listening i'm, I'm assuming there are people listening who have projects that they've been thinking about they've had things that they're kind of mulling over things they might want to put out there whatever that might be whatever that might be things they really want to pursue things they're passionate about is there a single I don't know if it's possible to have a single piece of advice that you would give to them but is there something that you, you would want to say to them or something that you'd want to suggest or advise is, it, is this for a business or for just any project whatsoever? a project it doesn't have to be a business I mean, it, it's hard to um, thinking about what could what I could say that about something that would apply in all of those cases. But I think the thing that comes to mind for me is just that um, I know that um, for myself, um, I have always found that my my interest and passion about a subject is what's carried me through all of the difficult times mm -hmm. in starting up any project because there's no way of over, there's no way of completely avoiding any fear or any risk or any 
uh, exhaustion or anything like that. And you've got to find something that's going to get you out of bed in the morning and that's going to actually make you want to do this project. Yeah. And so I just think that, um, you know, that that thing that you're really interested in is is what carries you through. I mean, I did... Um, but my career doesn't really have any clear trajectory. It's gone all over the place. But one of the things that I did was um, I went to live in Germany um, because I was just really fascinated by uh, Berlin and by learning more about the language and the people and, and being there. And that, you know, that was what sort of powered me to go and do that. Right. And um, I did a PhD and I met uh, during my PhD a lot of people who sort of got stuck doing PhDs because it, it's one of those things where finishing a PhD is, you know, it's a, kind of a cliche that people can carry on for years and never mm, get it finished. Mm. And I, I was just really lucky that, that, that um, I was doing a PhD about a subject that I was really, really genuinely interested to know the results of. You know, I was doing some analysis about a subject that I wanted to know what, the outcome would be and what it would mean and how it fitted into the wider context of, of scientific research in this field and what, you know, what the implications could be. <coughs> so that sort of, you know, cause there was a lot of really boring stuff to do, Yeah. but that's what got me through. Yeah. So I was genuinely interested in it and I felt genuinely passionate about it. And the same with starting the business. I was genuinely interested in what my business was about. And then I thought it provided real value that I thought, you know, this is something that is 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 a, a good thing to be for me to be spending my time on. That I I'm not going to regret whatever happens to the business. I'm not going to regret trying to do this because I really believe in it and I really think that this is important. So I know a lot of people who've made money and have done successful stuff just because they've seen an opportunity, a clever opportunity, some kind of financial arbitrage or whatever it is. And they're able to get excitement out of that. And that's, if that's where you're able to get excitement, great. But if you just see an opportunity, but you're not actually that interested in it, yeah, I don't think it's going to work. So I guess for those people, it's about there is an excitement for them and a passion for them in seizing an opportunity. And that's, what, right. that's, that's the thing that gets them out of bed in the morning. But if you, if you see an opportunity and you think, oh, I should take that opportunity, but you're not actually particularly passionate about it, that's probably not going to work out for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And because I think whatever you do, you're going to be involved in selling these ideas to somebody else. Even if it's a not-for-profit project, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you still, you still want to, uh, you know, Explain what your value proposition, whatever it is, your ideas, your blog, your project, your community thing, whatever yeah, it, it is. Yeah, you're pitching a story. You're, you're pitching yeah. something. It's always going to be you're trying to sell to other people. And the first thing that, you, that happens is that anyone you talk to is able to tell whether or not you actually believe in what you're doing. Everyone can tell that. You can't yeah. fake it. So, you know, if you, if you don't really believe in what you're doing, people will smell that on you immediately and they will not be interested and you'll get negative feedback and it'll be that much harder as well. Whereas if you believe in what you're doing and you really are passionate about it, even if you're at the stage where, you know, you've basically just got, you've, you know, you've written your uh, email address on a piece of paper because you don't even have business cards yet or whatever, you're still going to be convincing because people actually sense that mm. that you genuinely are believe in what you're doing and there's an integrity in that i think so that's the, the one thing that comes to mind for me great i think that's so helpful and yeah like i said thank you for sharing it my pleasure well thanks a lot for talking to me today it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast and i'm, I'm sure this will be really really helpful people listening we've covered a huge range of topics far more than i was actually <laughs> expecting but i think that's great because i i think there's a little something for everyone in here mm. so yeah thank, thank you, you so much. much for your time yeah thank you so much for having me on your podcast i really appreciate it so that's it for today thanks so much to jake for coming on the podcast i really enjoyed our chat and i hope you enjoyed listening to it too if you want to learn more about the kind of things that jake talks about you can find his website at thevoluntarylife.com or look up The Voluntary Life on iTunes. Thanks so much for listening today. As always, if you have any feedback, I'd love to hear it, so drop me a line at hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, -N -N -A -H, at net. I look forward to talking to you again very soon.